Hello, welcome to some video notes on the first section of the burn unit. Uh, so this whole unit, burn, is called burn because you'll be learning about the rules of combustion reactions and chemical reactions that have heat transfers or where energy is going to be moved from one location to another, either creating heat or creating cold. All right, so uh, the first section here, uh, learning about fire. Uh, we're going to learn about the fire triangle and what fire actually is and uh, what are the components necessary for uh, a combustion reaction or a, a, a reaction where fire is produced uh, to actually occur. So if you uh, remember, and here's our objectives, right? And also we're going to learn about how we test for oxygen and also how we test for carbon dioxide. Now, if you remember, at the end of the last chemistry unit, the three main characters, they went in to do their little exam with the pyros, and the pyros were so impressed uh, that they immediately tried to capture all of them and put them into a dungeon to force them to uh, reveal their secrets to make the pyros an even better uh, group of this uh, magic mystic arts, right? Because they don't understand science, they think all the chemistry that they're doing is actually magic. Now our main character here, he got out, and so he needs to figure out how he's going to help them, right? So Fitz and Speck, the other two, uh, he needs to break them out of the Pyro's fortress, right? And Uncle Boyle isn't really being a lot of help. He doesn't really know what to do. He doesn't know how to help them. He's not sure what's really going on. So we're really going to have to rely on Aunt Newt. And thankfully, Aunt Newt did receive uh, a message from some of the guards that she knew working in the Pyro's uh, at the Pyro facility. And she uh, says that this, this message will help them uh, pass another test. And if they don't pass this test to show that they really do have advanced understanding of the magical arts, uh, then they are gonna be turned into slaves and have to work for the pyros in an, un, um, an uncomfortable dungeon type situation, right? So you as the main character, or as the main character, you have to help uh, these two people, Fitz and Speck, uh, do well on this test. And so we need to determine uh, what information is hidden in this message so that we can help them with the pyro's next thing, right? The next test that they're gonna have to go through. All right, so the note said that there's, they're gonna have to do some type of compound reaction. So there is a specific test uh, skill that's going to be presented to both to Fitz and Spec at the same time. Uh, and so we're gonna have to determine what actually it is, this, this thing that they're gonna have to be doing over the course of the next few units. We'll be um, deciphering a puzzle, uh, so to speak, okay? so. First we need though is to figure out how to get them a secret message. And so we have to figure out how can we give them this information in a way that the pyros don't know that we've tipped them off, right? So that they actually end up doing better on the test than they really would. How can we help them in secrets, right? So the test in that note uh, that we're worried about. So this is the thing that we have to help Fitz and Spec get the answers for. And so this is the, the test of the pyros. And it says they have to complete the hidden symbols find the meaning of the song, say what happens to the atoms when the fuel has burned and gone, name the gas we need for burning, choose the fuel that burns the best, make some heat without a flame, do all this and pass the test. And so we've got this nice little rhyming poem here. Uh, and it's going to highlight all these new things that we're gonna be learning about chemistry as we go through the unit. And so we're going to help the main character decipher uh, the meanings of this song, or the meanings of, sorry, of this poem uh, as we go through each section, okay? All right, so that's where we are in the story. So the main character here doesn't really get what this poem means. That's perfectly fine. I'm sure you guys are in the same situation where I don't really get what that poem means. That's, that's totally random words. What is the significance of all of those new vocabulary words that we might or may not be seeing in this poem, right? So he's confused, so he's gonna go do what a kid should do. He's gonna go ask for help from an adult. Obviously, Uncle Boyle isn't being super helpful right now, so he's gonna go find Aunt Newt and ask Aunt Newt what is going on, right? So goes to Aunt Newt, and she says, um, maybe the secret notes, right? Uh, maybe hidden symbols is referring to an old spell, and possibly we could use this chemistry that you guys are talking about, the science, in order to try to reveal them. So we're talking about using some type of reaction, chemical reaction, to make material that is not visible, uh, visible, right? Now, you guys can actually do this in class, and to a certain extent, you can do this at home. 
Uh, unfortunately, because of circumstances, you're not going to get to do this in class. Uh, but what you could do is if you get a nice piece of paper uh, and you could use some milk or you could actually use different types of citrus juices like orange juice or lemon juice. I'm gonna show you an example I think that uses a lime. Um, and so you're gonna use the liquid in order to write out a secret message and then you let it completely dry. And if you didn't put too much on, right, you don't wanna put so much on that like the paper gets all wet and soggy and doesn't dry, you know, normal. You just wanna put enough on just so it goes into the paper and then eventually dries. Uh, you really shouldn't see it very easily. You might see a little bit of the lines, but it could be difficult to read. And then if we heat up the chemicals that we just put into the paper, we will cause a chemical reaction which will cause them to appear. All right, so if you're going to do this experiment at home, which you perfectly, it's capable of doing, uh, please make sure that you use proper safety precautions because you're going to have to use heat. Potentially it works best mostly with an open flame uh, and you would be holding paper near an open flame. I don't wanna hear any news reports about students from the school you know, having their house burned down because they're doing a chemistry experiment. So please make sure your parents are around when you try this and you know, do it in a reasonable fashion. But it would be something similar to this and show through the units, as we go through these, these video notes that you're gonna have to do, uh, I'm gonna do my best to give you uh, videos that you can find online so that you can kind of see what would have happened in class, even though we're not getting to do it in class, all right? So here, this is video. Let me uh, turn this down. Oh, background noise, there we go. All right, so we've got this lemon there, right? He's using a piece of wood to kind of dab it in just like a pen, right? To take the liquid material, uh, the juice, right? the citric acid from the fruits, right? And then he's writing some type of uh, message down. Now, uh, you can't really see it from this angle. You can't really see it. Ah, that noise, very loud music. Let's turn it down even more, okay? Uh, it can be very difficult to see it. And even this angle, you guys can't really even see very well what he's writing or what he's trying to write, right? And so once he's finished writing this, we're gonna jump ahead a little bit. All right, he's going to need some heat. So he's going to get uh, a lighter and light this candle. And so you guys can do this over a candle at home, right? And so being very careful with the paper, right? Now that it's completely dried, you need to heat the chemicals inside the paper, all right? And the heating of the chemicals causes a chemical reaction, causes a physical change in those chemicals. And as, as those chemicals start to change, they start to react with the heat to create color. And so you can see, right? You can see an R and an E there pretty clearly. Looks like uh, we've got a C and a T, right? And so as he heats the paper, causing the chemical reaction for the citric acid, we can reveal the secret information. So he's even written the word secret there. And what else has he got? Uh, he's writing, uh, this is, I assume you try to write, this is a secret instead of this is secret, right? Uh, so yeah, you can see the chemical reaction <laughs> revealing the secret information through this very simple chemistry experiment. So again, if you're going to do this type of experiment at home, just be very careful when you're heating the paper, because I obviously don't want you to light the paper on fire. But you do need to get the paper pretty warm, and the chemicals need to be pretty warm in order to get the, um, the, the, them to change color so you can see the secret writing, right? And so you guys would have did that. Right? And it would be like, oh, great, we did this with our secret paper. And so you did this with the secret paper, and you would see this. You'd see a triangle shape uh, with what looks to be O2 oxygen, and then a couple other question marks. So some things seem to be missing from this diagram, right? And so the song uh, must be some type of Pyro's chant, right? The song from the, the test that we were talking about, right? And so here, as we did this with another piece, part of the paper, we see this is the pyros chant that we revealed through our little secret um, uh, heating. Uh, fuel for burning, fuel for burning, make and break bonds, make and break bonds, heat in, heat out, oxidation, oxidation. All right, so in this pyro song, there's a whole bunch of information that we're gonna be learning about as we go through this unit. And so our first part here is thinking about, okay, what is the secret symbol here? What is this O2? and uh, this triangle shape and these other things that are missing. What is this referring to on the, the message that we've um, managed to reveal using our special secret heating method, right? So Aunt Newt's like, okay, urgent. We're gonna have to find out what the meaning is 
and what it is this is a gas that we need for burning, right? So that's one of the things that we could learn about. And we also need to know what is the fuel uh, when they burn. So what happens to fuels when they burn? So these are some parts of the test that um, FITS and SPEC need to know about. And so we can do some really simple tests to start thinking about what would be the answers to these types of ideas. So once again in class, you guys would have been uh, able to do these following experiments. First one, the gas we need for burning. We would have did some gas tests. So you would have taken a lit wood splint, right? You would take a little piece of wood, you would light it on fire, right? And then you would blow it out so that it's just kind of glowing a little bit, right? It wouldn't be fully burning. You wouldn't see a flame. You'd see like an orange coloring. And then you would stick them into test tubes. They were labeled nitrogen and also oxygen gas. And so you would see what would happen to the wood after it was placed into a test tube containing nitrogen gas versus what happens to a test tube containing oxygen gas, right? And so what ultimately you would see is that if you put the wood splint into the nitrogen gas, nothing happens because nitrogen gas, N2, is not really used for any type of uh, chemical reaction involving fire, right? A combustion reaction. However, when you put the wood splint into the oxygen gas, the test tube of oxygen gas, um, the wood splint would burst into flames and it would start burning again because oxygen actually is needed to do a combustion reaction. We need oxygen to be present. If there is no oxygen present, well, then we can't have a fire, right? So um, you, would, you would verify this through this oxygen test, right? And so one of the ways we can test for oxygen gas being present is by using what we call the lit splint test, right? So we light a splint, we light some paper, or light, uh, light a piece of wood, we blow it out so that it kind of has like a glowing ember look to it. And then we put it into the container of gas. And if it relights, if we see fire come back uh, on the wood splint, that means there's a really good high concentration of oxygen uh, present inside of that test tube. It might be mostly oxygen uh, inside the test tube. So once again, because you guys don't get to do this, uh, I'm going to have to show you some videos. So here is a video. Try that. Okay. Right. So there you just saw it and he's going to do it again. Splint. Right, so he's that got the wood splint. Test for oxygen. Right, and the fact that it relights right. means that oxygen must be present. So he's going to do it again. Right, he's going to take a lit splint inside that container. Might be a bunch of oxygen gas. So you can glowing. Right, he puts it in and it bursts into flames because of the oxygen gas being present. It helps restart the combustion reaction. It gets the fire burning. Right, and so he can do it. You know, as many times as he wants, as the oxygen gas is still present. Eventually, he will run out of oxygen gas, and it's just not going to work anymore. Um, but as long as there's a high enough concentration of oxygen inside this container, uh, he can keep redoing this over and over again. So he can do this kind of oxygen gas test. Okay. Now, the other thing you guys would have done is looking at what is produced when fuels burn, right? And in order to do this, you would have taken a candle inside of a Petri dish, and you would have lit it, and then you would have put a container on top of that candle, right? And then we would collect some of the gases that are produced. And so this container would be almost sealed. So the gases would collect inside. Eventually, all the oxygen would burn away. All the oxygen would be used by the candle in a combustion reaction. So when all the oxygen runs out, uh, the fire would go out, the flame would disappear. And then there would be gas present inside this container. And so what we would do is we would test for uh, calcium chloride. All right, so calcium. We test for carbon dioxide. I'm sorry, wrong thing. We would test for cal uh, carbon dioxide. I can't speak today. In order to test for carbon dioxide is really easy. We would use lime water. And so if we were to gather the oxygen, sorry, the gas inside this container, and we were to bubble it through lime water, which is a special clear liquid, uh, if carbon dioxide is present in a very high concentration, the lime water is going to react with the carbon dioxide, uh, changing it from clear to a kind of a milky white coloring, all right? And so once again, we can show you what this would look like, right, through some videos. It's all right? All right, well, sorry. Here we go. So here, uh, doing a nice simple test. All right, so oxygen extinguishing. So this is what it might look like. Let me jump ahead. All right, so here's the candle, right? Put the candle. Uh, inside the container. It's going to burn through all the oxygen fairly quickly. 
once all that oxygen is gone, right, fire goes out because we've converted all the oxygen into carbon dioxide through the combustion reaction. And you can actually even see some of the smoke, the denser smoke material collecting inside of this, right? And then if we were to test this, we would do a lime water test. And so we would collect that gas we just saw and we would bubble it through this clear liquid, which is the lime water. And so then as the carbon dioxide is added to the lime water, it's going to start changing to a kind of milky white coloring. You guys can see uh, right there that it's getting kind of cloudy, right? Definitely lighter in coloring because this is how lime water works. It reacts with the carbon dioxide, creating this insoluble material, which makes it the kind of white coloring instead of a clear coloring, right? And so here we can kind of do a side-by-side -side of, this is it before we add carbon dioxide and if carbon dioxide is present, it looks like this, right? Very clear color change. So that's what you guys would have done. You would have put the candle under the glass and the candle would have went burned out as all the oxygen disappeared. And then you could have collected the gas from inside the container, put it into the, um, the, uh, the lime water by bubbling it through the lime water. And by bubbling the gas through the lime water, it would change uh, from clear to a milky white. So that means, oh, this must be carbon dioxide present. And so by doing these tests, uh, we are learning, first off, uh, if we're thinking about oxygen that needs to, what gas needs to be present for burning, well, that's oxygen. <laughs> if we don't have oxygen present, we can't have a fire, right? And then if we think, what happens to the products when we burn them? Well, one of the gases that's produced when we burn things right now seems to be carbon dioxide. And so we can actually test for carbon dioxide pretty easily using something like lime water, okay? So, looks like we've learned some things. A combustion reaction that is called burning, the idea of burning is a, uh, a simple term, but in science, we would actually call it a combustion reaction, right? So we did a combustion reaction with our candle. The fuel particles are going to react with the oxygen in the air. So when we have a fire, right, when you guys have a burning splint or when you light a candle on fire, right, the fuel is keeping the whole chemical reaction going. It's the thing that is actually burning, right? If you light a piece of wood on fire, the wood is the fuel. If you light a piece of uh, paper on fire, the paper is the fuel. If you light a candle on fire, right, the wick is burning, but the wick is getting energy from the wax, the candle, right? The wax candle is the fuel. So there's all these different types of fuels that can exist. We're gonna spend some time in the overall unit of burn talking about different types of fuels and what happens when different types of fuels are going through a combustion reaction. Because we can uh, understand what type of materials we had when we see what types of products we get, right? So the oxygen that is going to be used in a combustion reaction, the whole reason why the, the combustion reaction is successful is because of the oxygen in the air around us, the 21% oxygen that's in the atmosphere, right? Typically when this happens, there's a lot of energy that gets transferred. Fuels have lots and lots of energy inside of them. So you guys have probably seen, you know, something burning before. I know you guys have used Bunsen burners in class. You can feel all of the energy coming off of the Bunsen burner. You can see the orange flame or the blue flame. You can see, uh, you know, that it's moving, you know, for all that energy being released. You can feel, <coughs> sorry, you can feel the heat you know, coming off of the flame, right? If you guys have been around a campfire or you guys have been cooking around a stove, you can feel that thermal energy, right? So when we do a combustion reaction, lots of energy gets released and most of that energy is going to be released as thermal energy. So we can actually feel the heat coming off of the chemical reaction. Okay, so we can channel some of that energy to power things, right? Some of that energy can be released as heat, but we can also use the explosive energy in fuels to run things, right? We can use charcoal to cook, right? We can change, you know, uncooked material into cooked material, right? But we can also use oil, gasoline, right, to power our cars. We can make jet fuel for powering airplanes. Uh, we can make the fuel that can be burnt inside of electricity plants so that we can generate electricity, right? So there's all these different types of fuels uh, that we could be using. But in general, any type of fuel, at least the, the things that we're looking at right now, uh, they are all considered the same type of fuel because they're all considered to be 
hydrocarbons, right? So a hydrocarbon is a fuel that's almost entirely made of just carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms, right? So your, the oil that we pull out of the ground, right? That's a big, you know, commodity around the world. Uh, that's a hydrocarbon. The gasoline that we then get from that oil is a hydrocarbon. The methane that we burn in our Bunsen burners at school, right? That is a hydrocarbon. So as long as it's only comprising of carbons and hydrogens, it's considered to be a hydrocarbon, right? And the name is really easy to remember. Oh, it's a hydrocarbon. It's made of hydrogen and carbon, right? And the thing is, is that hydrocarbons are also called non-metal fuels because both hydrogen and both hi and carbon are non-metals, right? So since they're both non-metals, we consider this to be a, a non-metal fuel. So we will look at metal fuels versus non-metal fuels as we go through some of the other parts of this unit. Okay, so carbon and hydrogen atoms, uh, they form a fuel when they join together with oxygen, or from the fuel, they will join together with oxygen to do a combustion reaction. So on page one, to the best of your ability, try to put down um, our word equations and then our particle diagrams. You still have to be able to do particle diagrams just like you did in the last unit. So here's a general equation for a combustion reaction using a hydrocarbon. So we have a hydrocarbon fuel, reacts with oxygen, so these are our reactants. Then we have our reaction arrow, and it produces two products. It produces two gases, actually. Carbon dioxide, which is a gas, in water as a gas, all right? Not liquid water, but water as a gas. And water as a gas is called water vapor, right? Water vapor. So it makes water vapor and carbon dioxide. So two materials, right? Solid or liquid fuels or sometimes gas fuels. It can be different forms. Mixing with oxygen gas makes carbon dioxide gas and water vapor, which is water in a gas form. Now, if we're to do this as a particle diagram, remember that you need to make sure you follow the correct rules of a particle diagram. You need to have the right number of circles donated with different ways for the different types of atoms that are present. So for this particle diagram example, we're gonna look at methane. And so methane is CH4, so one carbon for every four hydrogen atoms, right? CH4. So here we have a black circle to represent carbon, and we have four white circles around it to represent hydrogens. So four hydrogens with one carbon in the middle. We are gonna react that with oxygen. And if you remember from the last unit, oxygen is a molecule, it's O2. So we're gonna use blue circles here in pairs to represent O2, right? We have our reaction arrow, and it produces carbon dioxide and water vapor. So carbon dioxide means we have one carbon, and two di, right, it means two. So two oxygens, which are next to it. And we also produce water vapor as a gas form, or you could also call it steam as well. We have one oxygen, right, H2O is for water, and two hydrogens, right? And if you also look at this, this is a balanced particle diagram, right? We have one carbon here, one carbon here. Four hydrogens on this side, four hydrogens on this side. Four oxygen atoms here, right? I know there are two molecules, but four total atoms. Four total atoms of oxygen here. So not only do we have a nice particle diagram showing the burning of fuel through a combustion reaction, but it is also a nice balanced particle diagram because it has the right number of those particles uh, in order to show the correct way that this chemistry is done. So on page one, uh, make sure that you've added in this word equation uh, and that you have a nice particle diagram correctly made uh, to follow the particle diagram rules, okay? So if you need to, you can pause the video uh, and get that in before you move on, all right? Okay, so here we've got video of a candle burning, right? And so when we burn hydrocarbons, they seem like they disappear. If you were to burn a candle like this and then time lapse it, like I'm showing you here, it seems like it, as it melts, it just kind of disappears. But it doesn't really disappear all of the atoms are being changed into carbon dioxide and water vapor, which are gases that we cannot see, right? So the carbon dioxide and the water vapor, they're all flying around in the air above the candle. And as that's happening, the wax is disappearing. You guys see that the wax is disappearing because it's the fuel, right? So oxygen around the candle is reacting. 
Here the fuel is the wax. That's why the fuel is getting smaller because it's burning away. And then carbon dioxide and, and water vapor are all around the candle uh, getting released as uh, gases that we cannot see. Okay, so combustion reactions, they need to be given energy normally in order to get them to start, right? Which is nice because we don't want things just to start burning by themselves. Compounds are pretty stable, right? But if we give them a little bit more energy, we can start this chain reaction which causes them to burn, which causes them to uh, ignite and go through this combustion reaction. So imagine the idea, you remember when you guys are doing your Bunsen burners in class, you turn the burner on, you can hear the gas coming out of the burner, right? You can't see it, but you know that it's here. You kind of hear the hissing, right? You need a match in order to get the Bunsen burner to light on fire. It's not going to light on fire by itself. It's too stable. But once you get the Bunsen burner to light on fire, it then continues to burn. As long as you keep giving the burner fuel, fire will keep coming out of the Bunsen burner. If you run out of fuel, right, if you, if you turn the tap off, so that the Bunsen burner no longer has any fuel, eventually all the fuel burns away and the fire stops, right? The fire disappears. So if we're going to have a combustion reaction, we need a fuel like the gas coming from your Bunsen burners. We need heat, right? In order to get it started, we need something to help the thing start to burn. And then we also need the oxygen gas in the room around the burner to add oxygen to the combustion reaction. So in addition to needing energy, sorry, in, in, in needing fuel and needing oxygen, we also need a certain amount of heat in order to get the chemical reactions to start. Uh, same thing with like paper or wood, for example. It's, it's, they're not just gonna burst into flames by themselves. They need a certain amount of heat to get them to start burning, right? Some fuels can burn very, very easily. That's why gasoline is so dangerous. Uh, gasoline lights on fire with just a small amount of energy. So if you were around a gas, you know, flame, or sorry, gas fumes or gas liquid uh, in the gasoline form, uh, in the liquid form, and you just maybe let off some static electricity, you know, like a little static el electrical shock that you get, you know, sometimes when you touch a doorknob or something like that, uh, that energy from that little electric shock, that can actually light the gasoline on fire, right? So it doesn't need a lot of energy. That's why we have to be really careful with it so that we don't you know, accidentally light it on fire. Same thing with the methane gas that we use in the school Bunsen burners, right? That can actually burn very easily. You guys use a match in order to light it, but you actually don't even need a match. If you just made it a few sparks, right? If I gave you uh, some like uh, flint and rubbed it together to make a little bit of a spark, like electrical looking spark, uh, that could light the gas on fire, right? But the thing is that you need something to get it to start, right? Some things, some energy or some fuels don't burn very easily, right? Uh, like coal, for example. If you've ever used charcoal at a barbecue, getting charcoal to start burning takes a lot of effort. You either have to use some lighter fluid, which helps burn on top of the charcoal to get it warmer, or you have to fan it a lot to get more oxygen inside there around the charcoal so that it burns at a higher temperature so that it gets burning. But once charcoal gets burning, it can be burning for a very, very long period of time. It can take hours for the charcoal eventually to run out of energy and to run out of fuel and for the charcoal to stop you know, being warm, to stop doing this combustion reaction. But it can take a lot of time to get the charcoal to burn. So different types of fuels require different amounts of energy or different amounts of heat, right? Heat energy in order to get them to start, right? So once we've done an energy transfer though, the energy that they release is massive, way more than the energy that we put into them. When you guys burn, uh, get the Bunsen burners to burn, uh, you use a tiny little match. But once that tiny little match gets going, uh, the Bunsen burner just keeps going and going and going and releases a lot of heat from the Bunsen burner, right? Once you guys, you know, if you lit a piece of paper on fire, right, just one tiny flame can get the paper to light on fire, but then the paper will just keep burning and releasing more and more energy and create an even larger fire. So once a combustion reaction gets started with the right amount of heat, eventually large amounts of energy can be released through an energy transfer. And sometimes that energy transfers are really useful. And that's where we get all these different types of fuels that help run our cars and run our airplanes and even our rocket ships. Okay. 
Okay, so going back to the symbol, I think we figured out what is missing from it, right? So I think we found out some of our answers by talking about this. And the hidden symbols remind you of this, the fire triangle, oxygen, heat, and fuel. So these are the three things that are necessary in order to have a fire. If we do not have all three, the fire will go out. The fire will stop, right? If I've got, um, let's say, uh, I've got a, a fire on um, a kitchen stove, right? Some oil in my, my cooking pan is caught on fire, right? Well, I could easily smother the fire. If I put the lid of the pan on top of the fire, no oxygen can really get into the fire easily because I've, I've covered it with a lid. So eventually all the oxygen burns away and when there's no more oxygen, the fire goes out, right? If I've got a piece of paper on fire uh, and I don't want it to burn, well, if I put it in water real quickly, the fire will go out because by putting it in water, I take the heat away. I cool it down so quickly, there's no more heat to allow the fire to keep going. So I remove the heat, right? Or we can allow the removal of the fuel, right? If we had a forest fire, for example, uh, it could be difficult to smother an entire forest because it's too big. We also might not have enough water in order to remove the heat, right? But what we could do is if we clear the area around the forest so that the fire can't spread, eventually all the wood in the forest will burn, but the fire will then go, will go out because it won't have any more fuel because it burned all of the trees in the area and now the forest fire stops, right? So a lot of the forest fires that happen in you know, Australia, for example, or in California, that's one of the main ways that they deal with controlling those fires. They can't really smother the fire. They can't take the oxygen away. They can't take the heat away because it's, there's too much heat. There's not enough water, but they can take the fuel away. They can clear away the area so that the fire doesn't move from one place to another. And eventually the fire burns itself out by running out of fuel. Okay, so let's go over all these ideas. You guys have this page in your notes. All right, so you can pause this, fill out this missing information, for, do these practice questions, and then come back and we'll go through these answers. All right, so you paused it and you did this, right? All right, good. So here we've got our fire triangle versus our mysterious symbol. So what is the stuff that's missing in those question marks? Well, obviously that's the fuel and the heat missing from our fire triangle. And explain the meaning of the fire triangle to Fitz and Speck. Well, combustion reactions need all three parts, right? They need a fuel that's going to burn. They need heat to get their reaction started. And they need oxygen because it is a reactant in the chemical equation, right? It's going to react with the fuel. If we are going to put out a fire, or the vocabulary word is extinguish a fire, uh, we have to remove any of the three of them. So if any one of the threes are taken away, if oxygen is taken away, or heat is taken away, or fuel is taken away, then the fire is extinguished. All right, so you hope you got information like that down in your notes. All right, so our main character says, great, this is uh, only some of the message though. There's a whole lot of stuff that needs to be decoded first. So you guys have made a lot of progress here in our first series of notes, but this is only step one. And we've got a lot more to learn about chemistry, a lot more to learn about burning before we are going to be able to get Fitz and Speck out of the pyro prison uh, passing their tests. Okay, so that is it uh, for today. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, uh, please uh, let me know.